I've really enjoyed story time. <laughs> and so I'd like to read a little bit more because I, I'm just so proud of the heritage that we have as part of Chosen People Ministries. I'm proud because God has used Chosen People staff, board members, volunteers, supporters, prayer partners in so many extraordinary ways throughout the years. And uh, so I, I continue to read in this great book written, published in 1953, I Have Fought the Good Fight, written by Joseph Hoffman Cohn, the son of Leopold Cohn. And uh, this little vignette is very important to me because I just got back from Paris where we have started a Messianic congregation, which is the first Messianic congregation that Chosen People has sponsored and started since the beginning of the Holocaust. And so, Tom, we, 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 we applauded you, Tom, just so you know. And so, let me, let me read this little vignette um, that Joseph uh, wrote. And uh, he said, it is now 17 years since the work began in Paris under Pastor Henri Vincent sponsorship, who actually was also the president of the Baptist Federation of France. He agreed out of his own crowded life to be the honorary director and under his careful and economical management, the work grew. We now have four paid workers in a building all by our own on Rue Liana Court. We got too big for the Iglesias Evangelique, crowding these poor people almost out of their pews. Pastor, Pastor Vincent told me more than once with godly tears in his eyes, Brother Cohn, never have I and my church been so blessed as since we undertook the work with you among the Jewish people. Many a Jewish person was led into the waters of baptism at Iglesias Evangelique. Some of them stayed right on in Paris and have become devout members of the church and strong pillars so that the church thanks God for them over and over. Others were driven back to Germany by the laws which forbade them to become citizens of France or to find employment there. Among these were many believers, among these many believers were prominent lawyers from Germany, professors from Heidelberg and Halle, others who used to be high placed judges even in the upper courts of Germany. Many were doctors, surgeons, professional leaders in various directions. One of our women had been a high placed surgeon and physician in Germany. She had come to us with her family of three little ones, and one day she was brutally snatched away by the Nazis and finally landed at the notorious Buchenwald camp. Because of her medical skills, she was appointed the head doctor over 2,000 pitiful victims. After the French liberation, Pastor Vincent took 45,000 francs and went up to Buchenwald. By proper use of bribery, he got her out. She's now a leading surgeon in Paris while her children take great joy in coming to our Sunday school. This gives a little insight into the blessings that flowed out from those courageous undertakings of Christian service and testimony. It should also be said as a tribute to the consecrated love and devotion to Israel on the part of Pastor Henri Vincent, that during the Nazi occupation of Paris, the Nazis arrested him several times on the charge that he had conspired to pre protect the Jews from Nazi savagery. He had a record book of our Jewish membership, which they demanded that he deliver to them. This he steadfastly refused to do, although he knew it might mean imprisonment, torture, and even death. Such was the nature of his deep love for our people. I thought many times of how great will be his reward when he meets the Lord in glory. As president of the Baptist movement in all of France and as a leading religious figure in Paris, you can well realize the sacrifice and the danger he faced. But it said in testimony that just as God delivered Daniel from the jaws of the lions, so he too delivered Pastor Vincent from the Nazi beast who sought his destruction. Now, I have other records that I've read in my research, and actually, Pastor Vincent was missing for a year, 
Nobody knew where he was. Then he was presumed dead. And then one day he turned up and told his story. We have great shoulders that we stand upon. But there's also the truth that many people, not only the Nazis, have tried throughout the years to destroy the Jewish people and have failed miserably. There's a great quote written by a great American author that I'd like to read for you. Maybe you'll guess the author. It's a little lengthy, so bear with me. If the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but one quarter of 1% of the human race. It suggests a nebulous puff of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be, have been heard of, but he is heard of and has always been heard of. He's as prominent on the planet as any other people, and his importance is extravagant, extravagantly out of proportion for the smallness of his bulk. His contribution to the world's lists of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, are also very out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in this world in all ages and has done it with his hands tied behind him. He could be vain of himself and be excused for it, but yet the Egyptians, Babylonians, Persians rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greeks and Romans followed and made a vast noise, and they're gone. Other people have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out. And they sit in twilight now, and some have vanished. The Jews saw them all, survived them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert but aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jews. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Mark Twain, Harper's Bazaar, 1897. Wow. Well, Mark Twain, I'm not sure if he was a believer or not, but he certainly uh, missed it. And the reason he probably missed it is because he very well might not have been looking in the right place for the right answer. The right place, of course, would have been God's word, the scriptures, where all good answers are found especially about the Jewish people. And so what Mark Twain would have discovered, for example, if he would have read our text for the morning, Isaiah 62, he would have realized that God has a glorious plan for the Jewish people and that no human or satanic force can thwart the plan of God. And though the Jewish people might suffer and even be subject to incredible destructive activity. And many Jewish people would suffer, and many Jewish people would die. Still, whoever sought the destruction of the Jewish people made an enemy out of God, and like Haman, would soon be hung on the gallows that were intended for God's chosen people. And so God is faithful and as Bill Bright said, has a wonderful plan for the life of the Jewish people. Now we're going to take just a quick look at Isaiah chapter 62. You can open up in your Bibles, take out your iPads and phones. In Isaiah chapter 62, we read a lot about this glorious future. Isaiah is one of my favorite books in the Bible, some people, of course, have gotten confused, and they come to me and say, I really like your book, Isaiah 53. And I have to explain, I actually didn't write Isaiah 53. <laughs> I wrote a book explaining Isaiah 53. But it, of course, over the years, studying the book of Isaiah has been a hobby and a passion of mine. And you all know that there are certain people who say there are two Isaiahs and three Isaiahs and 
for, I think that you will probably meet one Isaiah uh, when you get up there, so don't bother looking for another. Now, you might meet a few basketball players named Isaiah, but you're only going to meet one great prophet named Isaiah. But it is true that you can divide the book of Isaiah probably into two parts. Some divide it further, which is, which is okay. But chapters 1 through 39, probably the dominant theme is judgment. I remember when I was teaching a Bible study in my home in Brooklyn, and I decided to do Isaiah verse by verse. That's a, a big mistake, because by about chapter 17, people have thoughts of deep depression. And a lot of judgment. But we turn, we turn the corner in chapter 40, Nachumu, Nachumu, Ami, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. And in chapter 40 through 66, we have the bright and glorious second half where Isaiah points to the incredible future that God has prepared for his chosen ones. You know, it's interesting, just one word about Isaiah 53. It's, it's sort of like the corned beef in the sandwich, you know. Because smack in the middle of that second part, speaking of a glorious future, is Isaiah chapter 53, because without the atoning death of the perfect suffering Savior, you would never have a glorious future. Neither Israel nor you and me. And I can say that the first coming is based on the second coming, and you know what I mean. Without his death, his sacrifice for sin, his resurrection from the grave, there would be no glorious future for anyone, just the stark, dark realities of future judgment. And so I'm very grateful for the second half of Isaiah. And we're just going to stumble through chapter 62 a little bit. There is a PowerPoint going on to my right. I don't actually know what's there because Abe's running it. So I'm just going to follow it verse by verse. I do believe that Isaiah chapter 62, and actually probably uh, quite a bit of the last part of the book of Isaiah and other parts of the Bible, is really the unfolding of the great covenant that God made with Abram many, many years ago, when he said that he's going to create a nation, a people, which he did. He's going to preserve that people, which he did. He's going to give the Jewish people a land, which again he did. And then he also promised that he would give the Jewish people a mission, a vocation. For God did not choose Abram and the Jewish people for the sake of of themselves, but for the sake of a broken world. Indeed, Jewish people were chosen by God to be a light and a testimony of his grace to the nations. If you're Jewish, you exist for the sake of the Gentiles. <laughs> it's true. And so this glorious future uh, God has planned for the Jewish people is really the unfolding of the Abrahamic covenant throughout the ages, where God will eventually keep his promises. You'll see bright moments where Israel is faithful, where God will keep his promises. And what that does is it, it, it points us in the right direction and gives us hope for the future. So God has granted some things but not all things, those await a future day which Isaiah describes. So first of all, there is a glorious future of the Jewish people, for the Jewish people, and God will not allow the Jewish people to be destroyed. No matter how hard the devil uses others to try and accomplish that task because the devil knows what's going to happen eventually. So he foolishly tries to enlist other pagan nations and satanically inspired individuals to try and destroy the Jewish people to prevent this future from happening. He will fail. And so we read in verse 1, Isaiah 62, For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, Isaiah knew something that was burning in his soul. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet. 
until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. God will not allow his people to be destroyed, even though it might look like we're on the ropes, but God will not allow his people to be destroyed until his people fulfill the destiny for which they have been chosen. There is a bright and glorious future for the Jewish people. It is our destiny as Jewish people to be righteous. Meditate on that one. I always love it when people go to Israel and they say, you know, I don't think that Israel is the fulfillment of prophecy. And I say, why is that? And they say, it's a very secular country. I said, it is, really. And, uh, and of course, especially Tel Aviv, which has about the worst architecture of any, it's a reflection of the morality of Israel, you know. And of course, it has one of the largest gay parades. I mean, I could go on and on and list the ways in which modern Israel stands apart from God, but you, you understand that according to Ezekiel 36, the Jewish people were to be regathered in unbelief and they were going to be made alive in the land. And so every time somebody tells me that the Jewish people and Israel is not the fulfillment of prophecy, I say, well, you've misunderstood prophecy. Actually, it's the fulfillment of prophecy but it's still a harbinger of what's to come. Israel in the land is not the Israel that will be in the land when the one who promised the land rules on his rightful throne. We go on to verse 2, because Israel's glorious future and, and the Gentile nations is tied, as Daryl mentioned in Isaiah. The nations will see your righteousness, and all kings your glory. And you will be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will designate. And so you shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. It's just a beautiful, beautiful picture. And it's a reminder of why the Jewish people exist and why God has given us a glorious destiny. It's for a purpose, and that purpose is to be a blessing to the nations. Through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How many of you here today are Gentiles? Raise your hand. Okay, that's good. I'm glad God made some Gentiles. Or well, Jews would have nothing to do. So bless you. <laughs> bless you, bless you. See. God chose the few to bless the many. And one day, it's all going to wonderfully be fulfilled. Also, we read that uh, the glorious future of Israel involves the land. Involves the land. It will no longer be said one day, forsaken. Nor to your land will it be said, desolate. But you will be called Hepzibah. My delight is in her. And your land, Beulah, which means married, Beulah. For the Lord delights in you. And then there's the most striking phrase here to me. And to him your land will be married. Boy, that's a tough one to really grasp. But the way I, I look at it is if God is the husband and Israel is the bride, then the land is the wedding present. Israel never earned the right to the land, never will earn the right to the land. We have the land promises by grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Unmerited favor. What do we do to deserve the land? Nothing. It's a gift, isn't it? And so, for as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. As the bridegroom, Yeshua, rejoices over the bride, so your God shall rejoice over you. And then in verse 6, we're introduced to a very misunderstood uh, concept. The watchman. So let me read verse 6. On your walls, O Yerushalayim, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. 
You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. I've heard that before. Marty, I don't know. We're, oh yeah, that, that wasn't that in a song. But a lot of people misunderstand what a watchman is. You see, the watchman are a, is a reminder in God's word that there is something that everyone who believes in God and his promises can do to help secure the future of Israel. And that is to pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They will prosper who love thee. We can pray. What does it mean to be a watchman? Well, look at the text. In the text, they're not doing what some people think shomrim, the word for watchman, would normally do. It's not that they stand on the walls and wait for the heathen enemies to come and try to attack and destroy Israel and warn the people. Look at the text. Isaiah is taking it in a different direction. That's not what he is saying. He's saying they will never hold their peace. They're a noisy bunch. You who make mention of the Lord, don't keep silent. Why? Because they are constantly reminding God of his promises, grabbing hold of God for his promises. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Are you a watchman? Now, I'd like you to be a watchman in two ways. One, that's our monthly giving program. So, so you can electronically transfer your entire bank account to chosen people. Once a month, once it reloads, just we'll take it again. Or you can use your credit card, and that way you get points. <laughs> yes, you can be a watchman in that way, but my appeal to you this morning is to be a watchman for Jerusalem by praying regularly for the peace of Jerusalem. And when you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you're praying that the Prince of Peace will reign in the hearts of individual Jews and Arabs, and that one day the Prince of Peace will reign on his throne forever. When you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you're participating with God in his grand finale. You're participating with God in his plan for both Jews and Gentiles. Because let me tell you, it's not just the Jewish people that are going to benefit from the second coming of Jesus. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be everybody. Yes. And we look forward to that great, great day. Amen. But also we need to proclaim, verse 10, this image of going through the gates and clearing a way for the people and building up the highway, removing the stones, lifting up a standard for the people, so making a clear pathway, so to speak, to the city of Jerusalem, to the holy city, removing the stones, preparing the pathway, lifting a standard, a banner. In verse 11, Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to Batzion, the daughter of Zion, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. In other words, one of the callings on our lives as followers of Yeshua HaMashiach, the current Prince of Peace, who will physically reign in a real, live, physical Jerusalem. Amen. Amen. Our prayer is for him to accomplish his work. Our work is to accomplish his plan in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are called to proclaim the good news to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. And let me tell you, if it works among the Jews, don't worry about some of the Gentiles because, you know, they're going to get in eventually too. Yeah. Romans 11, 11, they did not stumble so as to fall. May it never be, but by their transgression, the national rejection of Jesus at his first coming, salvation has come to the Gentiles Greek purpose clause, to make them, the Jewish people, jealous. Now, Jewish believers can have a role also, but so can Gentile believers. 
So let me summarize. God will preserve the Jewish people physically and spiritually. You believe that? Okay, you can amen that one. The Gentiles will receive God's blessing through the conduit of the Jewish people and the Jewish Messiah. Jesus said it in John 4, salvation is of the Jews. You believe that one? Okay. And God will place his Jewish people permanently in the land of Israel. We good? All right. I just want to make sure you got the teaching of the conference. All right. And then... Our role today is to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the salvation of the Jewish people. You with me on that one? And secondly, to proclaim, not just pray, but also to proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah. Make it clear, make it beautiful, make it attractive, be creative, but no matter how you do it, do it. And make Yeshua known to his chosen people so that all that God wants to accomplish will take place. Amen. Now, I'm going to switch gears for a moment because you need to know what's ahead in order for me to tell you what we're going to do about it. So, Abe, did you switch? He's so quick. So for some of you who would like to know... Based upon God's vision for the future, you have to start there, don't you? Then what is our vision as a ministry, 125-year-old ministry among the Jewish people? What is our vision for the future? Because it is built on the foundation not only of our glorious history, but our glorious future, prepared for us by our glorious God. So our vision for the future is built on the success of the past. The future of our ministry actually rests upon four pillars that Chosen People has been built on for 125 years. And I stress pillars and foundation because once that 125 years is properly celebrated, and we're really honoring those who have gone before us, which I think is a wholesome and healthy thing to do. Once we understand that foundation, we honor that foundation, then we seize the future with every ounce of strength we have and move forward to the glory of God. So here's the four pillars. Yeshua is unchanging. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's God in the flesh. He lived a perfect life. He's the Jewish Messiah for all. This Yeshua has not changed. We worship and serve the same Yeshua that Leopold Cohn served, that Joseph Hoffman Cohn served, that the Apostle Paul served, that Peter served. He is unchanging. And our message is unchanging. The gospel is the same ever since the day of Pentecost. So next week when you remember the falling of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples in that upper room, remember that they then began proclaiming the first sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is preaching the gospel. And when they started preaching the gospel, I'm going to tell you what they preached. They preached the same thing that we preach today. Whether it be in person, on digital media, it's the same message. And as long as I'm so privileged to lead a ministry where the gospel has not changed. And the word of God is still preeminent and perfect and powerful. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both joint and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We believe the word of God is perfect, as did King David in Psalm 119, when over and over and over again in the longest psalm of the Bible, in every which way, using every adjective he could find, he made it clear that the word of God is perfect. We believe the word of God, and it's as powerful today as it was yesterday. I am so proud of the chosen people's staff because they preach the word of God. And that's one of the hallmarks of our congregations in Bible studies. Sometimes we use a lot of illustrations, you know, but eventually it's the word of God. Third pillar, God has preserved a remnant 
today. There is a remnant according to the election of grace. Sometimes people want to throw a pity party for me and our other staff members and say, oh, you must be, you know, uh, you must, you're really doing a good job. It's a really hard mission field. This, you know, I get up in the morning, I'm having fun. I don't know about some of you. I don't, I'm, I'm excited about the work. I'm, 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 I have a smile on my face, even driving into Manhattan or taking the subway, you know. I have a smile on my face because, yeah, well, it may not be a massive movement. It's a heck of a lot uh, more than it was before, but it's still a remnant. And so the one beautiful thing about being in Jewish missions is that we're the one ministry that has been assured a temporary victory. There's a remnant according to the election of grace, according to the King James. Our job is simply to proclaim the word of God and hold out our hands and let them come in. Amen. Maybe there won't be baskets full, but boy, one day that's going to change. Amen. Because our last, our last one is this. One day all Israel will be saved. Go ahead, Abe, you can push it. Push it, push it, push it. Yeah. You're good. Paul writes, I don't want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery or be wise in your own estimation. A partial hardening. Who's happy it's a partial hardening? I am, or I wouldn't be here. It's a partial hardening that has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. If there's anybody I'm looking for, it's the last Gentile. I don't know about you. If you have his or her email address, send it along. Because when I find them, I don't care where they live in the depth of Africa or China, I'm on a plane, you know? Because when that last Gentile comes to Yeshua in this day and age, then the glory of heaven gets poured upon the Jewish people and all Israel will be saved. And finally, I will no longer be part of a minority movement. <laughs> the deliverer will come from Zion and remove our sins. Ungodliness. So, brothers and sisters, one day our work will be done. But we must work the work of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. All evangelism is on the blessed clock. So don't wait for an invitation. You've been invited to pour out your life on God's altar in sharing the gospel with both Jews and Gentiles because there are many people alive at this very day that won't have another chance. Do you believe in the urgency of the gospel? I do. Well, let's wrap it up. Our mission statement, again, just to remind you of it, is to remind the church, well, you know our mission statement. Chosen People Ministries exists too. You ready? Pray for. Anybody know it? Evangelize. Disciple. Serve. Who? Jewish community. And to help other believers do the same. So, for you folks, you need to understand that we need to remind the church of God's promises to the Jewish people and of the divine mandate to reach Jewish people with the gospel. We're going to keep doing that to encourage prayer for the peace of Jerusalem as Israel will become more and more significant to the unfolding of God's plan in these last days. And then I'm going to conclude with just one thought about our future. You know, when you're the seventh leader of a 125-year-old Jewish mission and you know for sure that you are not the founder, and actually I'm the first, quote-unquote, outside president that chosen people selected. Six all came from inside. I was barely outside because I served with all the daughter ministries. We usually call them splits, but I was served with all the daughter <laughs> ministries and then came back home to the first... Jewish mission that ministered to me. And so a lot of our staff had this great sense and desire to raise up a new generation to perpetuate this wonderful ministry to the Jewish people. 
until the day when we no longer need it. And actually, we look forward to that day. Can I close, can I just read one last story from this wonderful book? It's an interesting little story. It's kind of poignant. And it is uh, at the very end. I'll read it. On Thursday, October 1st, 1953, Joseph Hoffman Cohn finished correcting the proofs of this book. In his bold hand, he jo jo joyfully wrote Fini on his copy. Indeed, indeed, he had fought a good fight, but he had also finished his course. Four days after completing this book, Dr. Cohn was called home. The Lord had vouchsafed for him a rare and special privilege. He had written his autobiography right up to the end. This book is the last of Dr. Cohn's earthly labors. He was spared until his work was finished. No monument in stone can fittingly honor the memory of this missionary warrior statesman. His monuments are living ones. The hosts of Jewish people who were led to the Lord through the mission and the countless believers throughout the world whose lives and testimonies were transformed by his ministry. These are living monuments witnessing to the faithfulness of this servant of God. Now listen to the conclusion. We, the members of the board of directors of the American Board of Missions to the Jews, thank God for the honor of strengthening the hands of Dr. Cohen during the last years of his life. We moreover covenant together with one another, with God and with his people, that the work that the work of this mission shall continue on the principles to which Joseph Hoffman Cohn gave his life. His earthly labors are finished. His work by God's grace, continues. Amen. Amen.